Hello and welcome to the Recruit Rockstars podcast, where we focus on the people part of private equity and venture capital portfolio companies. And I am thrilled to welcome today's guest, who knows a ton about this topic. Kelly Carlson is the managing director, the head of talent at STG. And if you don't know STG, it's Symphony Technology Group. Based out in the Bay Area, she spends her time in the Bay Area, she spends her time in Chicago, but most importantly, she spends her time working directly with STG's portfolio company CEOs to build the best possible executive leadership teams. And the reason I was so excited to have Kelly on is prior to this role and this life in private equity, she built one of the premier retained executive search firms in the U.S., Tillman Carlson, which she led as CEO. Before that, she was at Russell Reynolds. So it, it's hard to think of someone, frankly, who knows more about this stuff than my friend Kelly. And Kelly, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for making the time. Thank you, Jeff. I, I'll shoot you my PR fee after we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I guess, I guess why don't we start at the 30,000 foot level? Uh, how bad is it out there? So right now, if you're trying to recruit CEOs, CFOs, executive top team members for a growth stage company, how does this day and age compare to what you've seen in your some odd years of recruiting? Yeah, you know, I would tell you that um, you know, I, I've always viewed attracting teams as a challenge, right? If, you know, I always said way back when during my search career that I wouldn't have a firm if there wasn't a need. If it was easy, they wouldn't need us. Um, I'd say the difference in today's environment versus you know, the last 20 years, if we bucket it together, is that you know, we're all competing for similar talents. So yeah. I think when you aim at you know, the CEOs and the executive teams of private equity backed or sponsor backed businesses, you know, we're all looking for similar um, skill sets. Yeah. And you know, there are limited quantities of those. So if a CEO or a CFO, et cetera, CXO gets a call, from one of us, he or she's getting a call from 10 of us. And yeah. so it's a, it, not only is it a war for talent just in terms of sheer volume of talent, but I think then it's you're competing against the velocity of the market and the movement of executives. So you've got you know, kind of more than one theme that's running through the, the talent wars now. So if you can't compete on money, because I assume there's always someone that can pay more than we can, what do you compete on? What is it that leaders are looking to today to make their decision on which of those 10 calls to return? Yeah, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's first and foremost how we treat people. I mean, we're all human beings at our core. And so, you know, the way I've always approached my time in talent, broadly defined, whether it's on search or in the private equity markets, is that, you know, we're dealing with people who have you know, they're, they're capable, they're qualified, they have a set of competencies that makes them marketable, and they want to work with people that are like-minded and yeah. that are similar values and philosophies. Um, clearly, there has to be some um, attraction to either the, the business case or the business model. It can't all be about wealth creation. So, you know, we at Symphony, as we've built this role, and I've come in from, uh, you know, the outside to build it from scratch, part of the mandate was to do just that, is to to build an awareness of what it's like to work with us as an investor and you know the partnership that we try to have with our CEOs and the management teams. You know, we're not there to, to run the company, right? Yeah, so we're sure. dependent you know, on having you know, the investment. We have the, the transformation playbook that's unique, obviously, to us. And then we have to have leaders um, to lead that and execute. And you know, so that as I look at it, I look for that skill set. And you know, it's you know, treat people courteously, do what you say you're going to do. I and mean, kind of basic truths of if you say you're going to call back, call back. Um, yeah. And that matters. In today's and, a, and unfortunately, they're not as common as people might think. No, not at all. <laughs> so give us some, some just high level numbers on STG. How many portfolio companies roughly are we talking about? Um, we have uh, 15 as of today's count. And, and that's, you know, that's a typical number for yeah. us. And we try to you know, obviously market dependent. It's a competitive market for getting deals done. We did four platform deals in 2018 and we've done one plus tuck-ins in 19. And, and you know, we only invest in you know, software SaaS and tech enabled services businesses. So we're in a, a, a defined market niche and a certain size and, and, and scale. Typically control deals or non-control deals or you'll go both, you'll do both? Our deals have, have historically always been control deals. Got it. Got it. And so this is a pretty typical, classical technology-based private equity. 
Yep. You know, we come in, we're not the first investor. We're, you know, we're yeah. there when they've, when they're scaled enough where they're, they can benefit from the operational excellence and some of the process discipline and transformation efforts that our teams are you know, really skilled at. Which I know there's a lot of areas, but are there a few common themes where on the talent front, the people front, you can accelerate the growth of these companies and really put the pedal to the metal? What gaps do they often have when STG makes an investment? You know, I think it's interesting, especially in today's climate of investing. I mean, many cases here in, in the recent past, over the last 12 to 18 months, you know, we are bringing you know, a couple of businesses together at close. So you're taking two businesses, two cultures, and making them one overnight. And so yes. as you think about what do they need for success and what does that mean to the leader, leaders who have been through M&A integration, um, you know, there's always, because it's software and SaaS, there's a product strategy roadmap piece to it. You know, where's it headed? How yep. do you rationalize? Yep. We, we tend to think about what we can do in technology and technology process improvement. Um, but we always know that it starts with having a terrific CEO. And if we have a CEO in place, you know, typically strong leaders recruit strong leaders. And so there's a, a domino effect that, that takes place within the portfolio company if we can get that right. And the sooner we get it right, the better. So you'll walk away from the deal if you love the company, you love the business, but the CEO is not the, the, uh, the horse that you want to bet on, or will you make the investment anyway, knowing that you might change out the CEO? Yeah, I would say we wouldn't necessarily walk away solely based on um, the assessment of the, the CEO in place. And we, we obviously go into the, the diligence looking at people, the human aspect of it as one of the criteria um, and our deal teams dig deep into that and, and certainly yeah. they, they get a good idea, not yeah. only on the team we're inheriting, but you know, are they committed to the next chapter? Because there are, you know, that's a pivot point for um, folks when they go through that window. With your expertise in executive search, you bring a ton to STG in terms of the fund's ability to assess executives so you know what you're getting or, or where the weak spots might be or opportunities might be. I'm curious, how do you... How do you assess executives for potential to really scale? Because I have to assume when you make these investments, some of these companies you're hoping are going to double, triple, quadruple, I don't know, 5X, 10X, whatever. Uh, what do you look at to know if the VP of sales is going to scale or the head of marketing is going to scale or the CFO, let alone the CEO? So yeah. the, whole, the whole top table. I think when, you, when you're looking at someone's potential, and I, I, I tell you, we love um, – yeah, we, we've had a great track record of people that have not been standalone CEOs. You know, they've been large P&L owners in different environments and, and we've you know, put them into their first quote unquote um, standalone CEO role. We've, we, we love that profile. It's worked well for us and it's had really nice returns. Yep. And so that, you know, that's, and I did that with them as a search partner, you know, prior to joining in my capacity today. Yeah. I always look at, you know, can the person really tell me how they've, they've worked through challenges. Have they been exposed to scale early? So what's that foundational set of experiences? And um, do they have a, a knowledge of what great looks like? And, and, and that's, I think, and, and will we achieve great in every category? Maybe, maybe not, but we definitely want to be you know, good in everything. And, and you can have just that special DNA that you can climb any mountain, but in many cases, we, we um, have to play devil's advocate. And so it's a bit of show me, walk me through. We do really detailed interviewing um, yeah. here at the team. And then we've married that with external assessment um, you know, as well, just you know, to make sure we bring a little bit of science into the art. Um, you know, and I think that's important. I think having data, multiple data sets and then confirm that through referencing, yep. uh, you know, the triad, if you will, as you think about projecting. You, you said in-depth interviews, just give the listeners a sense of what that might entail. It's multiple touch points. So, I mean, yeah, it will start, you know, if, if I'm, you know, and I do CEO work for the portfolio. So as we have CEO needs in the portfolio, that's one of my, one of my four categories of what I yep. focus on. And yeah, so it will typically start with outreach in a targeted way from me as the quote unquote recruiter, um, if you will. And um, there's then, you know, interaction with, with our deal team. And uh, there's interact and that's in more than one time, you know, that yep. could be it. Yep first interview, and then it typically is followed by an in-depth working session prior to any offers being extended in yep. pair with the referencing and assessment. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the get to know, and then you kind of have the filter, do you, you winnow that down to a couple of finalists and those finalists can go through two to three hours 
you know, with our deal team, you know, as appropriate with the management team at the portfolio company. It depends. It's situational. And then come up with, you know, here's my 100-day plan. Yeah. That so everyone's aligned, you know, in advance of someone's someone's arrival. Which do you think is the most useful? So in-depth interviews, you mentioned a working session, kind of a test drive, reference checks, which I'm sure in your case include backdoor references. If you had to rely on one as the one that has kept you out of the most trouble over the years, which do you think it might be? Yeah, that's that's tough for me to pick one. It's like choosing your favorite child, right? No, I mean, it is. like I would tell you that for me, if I say, if I'm speaking um, personally, for me, the working session is where I get the most. Um, you know, because you're taking someone off script. Yeah. You know, in an interview, a person can be relatively rehearsed and, you know, in a working session, they have to basically apply that to a new environment. It, it, but that is followed so closely by you know, being able to confirm that yeah. through the yeah. reference. I mean, I think referencing is invaluable in today's. Business. But it's, but it's interesting that you said that Kelly, because if I read between the lines, you're kind of saying interviews are the third. And I think most of our listeners, that's all they do is interviews, and even then, most, you know, most executives uh, are only fair at interviewing because you know, they only do it so often, and they trust their gut. Then they skip the test drive or the working session. They don't really spend time on reference checks, and then they wonder why there's so many mishires, right? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I, I think in, in our environment, I'm speaking solely for STG's environment, I, you know, I think we are, you know, we have that just as a, a best practice discipline, and that was in place prior to my arrival. So yeah. I'm not taking ownership yeah, of, course. of course. part of the process prior to, but even in my search career, when I would work with clients across a multitude of industries um, and functions, I would always suggest as a best practice of look, get through your interviews, you do your, do your team interviews, you know, come back, do debriefs. And then when you get to a finalist, you'll come back and have a real working, talk about the real issues, talk about yeah what a day in the life is going to look like here, or what challenges you're going. And if a candidate can be very um, you know, precise and they can be um, informed and they can ask good questions and they can be transparent in that discussion, chances are that will translate into how they operate on a day-to-day basis you know, with the deal team, with the management team. And that's, you have to have this trust built up um, when you're putting a senior leader into a company that you've written a big check for. Um, right. So why not find out before you write the check as opposed to after you write the check? Right. The opportunity cost for the mishire is so significant, um, both in terms of thesis, money, you know, re- resetting the, you know, the course correction. Yeah, yeah. And that was my next question. So without naming names, can you give an example? Oh, and it doesn't have to be from STG, but over your long search career of just for the listeners, the impact that a bad hire can make. Yeah, and I just, and I'm going to speak, and this is in, in great generalities because I have, you know, knock on wood, um, I yeah. have, I'm still in the, the year one, um, so I thank God don't have any horror stories. Uh, but but now, you've heard some. But I've certainly been in you know this industry long yeah. enough, and and you know all of us would love to say we're 100 percent on, but we all have had our moments. You know, the, I'd say the the most important thing when when a mishire, um you know, happens is, is the, the potential damage that's done just, you know, culturally to that leadership team, right? So I think first and foremost, there is, you know, the wrong person potentially steering the ship functionally or within a CEO role. Yeah. And then you've got a team that, you know, either has been kind of led down a course that isn't going to lead to the right outcome or potentially is in a, a cultural setting that is, is, damaging right and so you end up having flight risk underneath or you have people yep. that kind of back out of their jobs yep. so there's, there's like a whole people component where you've got a, a people culture aspect then then you have the, the whole business um, piece of it so things that needed to get accomplished on certain timelines are then pushed out and um, it tends to mean that you you know additional investment dollars are going to need to be placed into yep. um, the company or the function and um, and or tough decisions that needed to be made. So the flip side, if, if the team wasn't the right team, sometimes those tough decisions weren't made and therefore that elongates as well. So, I mean, it's hard to quantify it, but I mean- there's but you could lose a year easily, right? We say, you know, across the board, as I canvass the human capital leaders that sit in chairs like mine as I got started, a year to 18 months is typically mm-hmm. the, the opportunity cost for a bad hire. And then people, people scoff when they hear these numbers, right? And the reality is that it can be millions of dollars in opportunity oh, sure. cost. Sure. 
massive. You, I also want to touch on something else you mentioned, which is uh, assessments. Mm -hmm. So assessments, it's no secret that some private equity firms swear by them to assess executives. Others laugh at them and don't use them. Um, it, it strikes me as that, you know, no one's ever going to quite agree on this topic, but what gives you confidence as you look to an assessment? How do you use an assessment? Mm -hmm. If the assessment says don't hire, do you just immediately not hire? Or is it just a piece of data that informs your decision? How do you avoid false negatives and positives? So we do not have a uh, an approach or a methodology to assessment at STG that has a hire, don't hire philosophy. Um, and I fundamentally, as, as I was asked to build assessment as um, an area of expertise for us and to use it as a differentiator, it was, it was built with the um, objective of helping us understand our leadership teams better um, and using it in the appropriate fashion. And so we have different forms of assessment based on the functional leader. So it's a different assessment by role? So by role. So a yeah. CEO will go through some different assessments yeah. that are slightly more stringent yeah. than perhaps you know, folks that are you know, one, one or two direct yeah. reports below. And, we, and, and with that, you know, there's an online piece of it, and then there's the industrial psychologist piece of it, and then there's our own due diligence and assessment as a professional team inter interacting with the, a candidate. All of those pieces together help us make a decision that's then confirmed by our referencing, <laughs> right? So it's, to me, it's a data point because there are some people that quite frankly aren't great test takers. That's true. That doesn't make them poor executives. It just means yeah. they're not great test takers. Yeah. Um, we tend to use the assessment feedback, you know, as an onboarding tool that we can have really honest discussions. You know, the, the CEOs receive the feedback um, from the assessment, from the assessor. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's given back. And they invest time, we, have, we give them some data back. And then we all talk really openly of, hey, if you have someone that has a blind spot that you know, they like to be out in the market and they're not, they don't love the operations, let's make sure they've got a great operations leader on their team, right? How yeah. I love that approach. So it's much more a feedback mechanism and discussion starter for coaching and development than it is a big X or a green light or something like that. That's yeah. kind of an oversimplification. It, 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 but you know what? It's it's just you know, we are we are firm believers that you know, data is helpful. Let's face it, you know, in a private equity um, firm, data is always king. Uh, so it is yet another data point, but it is one of many. It's not yeah. just the one. And I think some firms take it as the one, and that's okay. I think we all um, agree that we have our own philosophies based on our firm's cultures, and and it works. I mean, I can't say someone else's approach doesn't work for their firm. This is just ours. Yeah, it is kind of like a religion type of thing. Just different people have different approaches. One last topic before we wrap up, which is retention. So we've talked about recruiting and hiring. Um, what advice would you give to listeners who run a business or a fund or a department uh, in this day of war for talent to come full circle to our first topic uh, when you're at risk of losing your best people? Because Kelly Carlson's calling them all day long to try to hire them away. Uh, how do you make sure you don't lose them? And and it's got to be more than just money, right? I mean, hey, at, at the end of the day, um, there's no surefire way to make sure that a leader doesn't take a call and, and take another opportunity. And I've been of the mindset through my entire career that if that happens, no matter what we would have done, you know, we likely wouldn't have kept that person because the driver to make that decision was something um, that you're right, it wasn't monetary. And so, you know, when we you know, sit down at the, at the inception of a relationship with a new portfolio company, you know, there is, you know, the deal partner is there day one, you know, there's you know, the whole town hall aspects of it. You know, we, you know, and, and there's in the cases where businesses haven't been PE back before, they're going through a huge learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, you know, I do think that the way we approach partnering with with our portfolio companies, with people like me and Cher and other operating advisors that you know, are in essence kind of um, there, um, as I, I call those luxury items yep, sometimes, yep, yep. that we're there for people's um, help. I think that the greater degree that we can get people focused on what the North Star is, so why is it that we were excited about the, the thesis and get people motivated to that? I mean, that's 
if you can get to their heartstrings, chances are you'll have a better chance of retaining. But there is an onus on all of us to make sure that we're aware of issues, that we don't push issues out too far if there are issues that are communicated back to us, especially as it, it pertains to the people aspect of it. Yeah. Hopefully if there's change management that, that needs to occur, cultural integration or you know, coaching and you know, kind of getting the team together and getting them cohesive, you know, there are ways for us to provide that um, service, if you will, through advisors and consultants that we've built up through our network. And, and, you know, and I find that you're right. It can't always be about money. You're re-upping on a new investment thesis that has right. your cycle. Right. So what can you do? Can you put them in development programs? Can you, you know, give a, a person a chance in a different career stretching role? Those you know, as long as you can give people the nuggets of what might come, obviously with the reality of you have to perform and we have to hit metrics and, and KPIs, et cetera, um, that's, that's the best way because in dollar for dollar, you, you, you know, all of us have limited checkbooks. Sure. Like Amazon that. can always afford to pay more than we can, right? And companies still have to hit their budgets. So yeah, right, right. Can't, can't drown them. But you're be I'll, I'll bet, I'm assuming you would say that your best CEOs, this is what sets them apart. They're able to proactively get ahead of it, understand the concerns, the career aspirations, just the names of the kids of their, of their executive teams, right. leadership teams. I mean, you hate to think that it's just some of it's just the basic tenets of how we were raised, but, you know, taking a few moments to understand, you know, a person at a human, again, at, yeah. I go just goes back to at a human yeah. level because yeah. we're dealing with human beings and, and there is a, people work really hard and just, you know, little things that, that reinforce that, Hey, you're doing a good job or, or making progress just you know, where it's not, Hey, we're, we're behind, you know, yeah. there's always going to be, um, pitfalls along yeah, the way, no yeah. what kind of company you're in. Yeah. So being able to, to kind of celebrate the wins and minimize the losses, kind of stay steady handed through that. And you're right. I mean, we say one of the, one of the qualifiers as we thought about this role was the, the logic of great CEOs tend to not only retain teams, but then they also attract teams. They tend yeah. to have people that follow them. Yep. So if we can get that right, it, and that's something you can look at in their past. You can actually right. audit them and say, look, people tend to follow this person, which and says that, something. That says a lot. I mean, so the, the more we can get that right, the better. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you have to have people aligned to the outcome. And, and that's you know, certainly up to us to make sure that that outcome is understood. Well, you bring great uh, Midwest sensibilities to <laughs> one of the premier technology and software private equity funds, Symphony Technology Group. Kelly, I'm thrilled to have you on the show today. How can people learn more about STG or get in touch? Well, they can go to stgpartners.com. Um, that's uh, our, our website. And you know, I'm right there and happy to help. And I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks, Jeff. Talk to you soon.